in my you know decades long career in the securities industry, I'm often asked how, what is one of the things that makes the American financial system the envy of the world? And it is, it's not perfect, but it, it is the best on the planet. And one of the things I point to is that, you know, we have a, an industry of, you know, really innovative, driving hard, competitive players. We have a regulatory regime, you know, whether it's the SEC or whether it's the CFTC and other <clears throat> uh, governmental bodies in state and local and federal. But what we have in the middle is unlike <clears throat> and unusual for the rest of the world, we have FINRA, which is a really, really <clears throat> critical role, plays a really critical role as a self-regulatory organization, and they do it better than anyone else. So I think that that uh, when you understand the overall um, vigor and rigor of the U.S. Uh, financial services system, you really do have to understand that all these different players are involved and that we have, uh, we're really, really lucky to have both an organization like FINRA stepping in as a self-regulatory organization uh, between you know, their members and between uh, uh, industry and, and, and helping drive industry practice. And let's give a shout out to, to Guy and the rest of the media because it need, we need that transparency. We need that spotlight in order to illuminate the issues and, and, and have that, uh, that uh, rigorous discussion. So again, uh, thanks to both Guy and Robert. Great session. Um, really do appreciate it. <clears throat> we are now um, uh, getting ready to do uh, the next panel, which is Another um, regulatory focused panel. Uh, this one is focused on the Securities Exchange Commission and you can never uh, under, uh, understate the impact that the Securities Exchange Commission has in making sure that we have a fair, efficient and equitable markets here in the United States and, and, and with first and foremost investor protection. <clears throat> We're very lucky that this panel is gonna be moderated by uh, Michael Piavar. Michael is the executive director of uh, the Milken Foundation, and he specifically is the executive director of the Milken Institute Center for Financial Markets. Uh, he's also a distinguished policy fellow here at the Georgetown Center for Financial Markets and Policy here at the McDonough School of Business. I've gotten to work with him many times over the years at NASDAQ when he was in the Banking and Finance Committee. We had Bob, our CEO, Bob Grayfell, come in and testify, or whether or not it was when he was at the SEC, um, you know, trying to push forward different, uh, uh, working together on different objectives, et cetera, coming out of the financial crisis. He's always been, you know, uh, really thoughtful, um, really um, <clears throat> uh, smart um, person, but he's also someone who, that is really patient, really takes the time to hear all sides of an issue and uh, and uh, couldn't ask for a, a better person to to have been in the role when he was at the Securities Exchange Commission as a commissioner. Um, he uh, He's also a Hoya, so that's always a big plus. He got his MBA at Georgetown. He, he went somewhere else for some other degrees, but we don't talk about that at a Georgetown conference. Um, Mike is going to be talking to uh, two SEC commissioners, Commissioner Crenshaw and Commissioner Roisman. We're delighted to have them both. Um, I cannot imagine a more interesting time to be an SEC commissioner. Maybe the financial crisis <laughs> back in 2009, maybe uh, when the SEC was first formed, but right now the issues facing the U.S. securities markets are second to none. I think we've seen this theme mentioned by multiple speakers we've had throughout this conference that um, all the things going on today, whether it's the racial injustice that we talked to, that Guy and Robert just talked about, whether it's the issue of the um, pandemic and the impact on the economy, the shocks of oil, the trade wars that we've had, all those issues are just accelerating the changes to financial services and the firms of financial services. That's why the theme of this whole conference has been um, how financial markets are addressing societal changes. So. Um, I think it's, a, and, and the SEC is absolutely at the crossroads and center of that discussion. So um, I am just uh, can't, uh, I'm looking forward to learning a lot. I always do. And uh, so at this point, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Mike and uh, give, uh, let Mike uh, take over and, uh, and uh, go ahead and uh, moderate his panel. Thanks, Mike. Great. Thank you, John. And um, just to reiterate your point about that the SEC is at the intersection of a lot of important things going on right now. Um, we actually have a, um, a very slight delay from, uh, from our two commissioners who are going to join us because they're actually busy 
uh, working on some things right now. So they're going to join us in a few minutes. But um, what I thought I'd do, John, is maybe um, we could go ahead and start with the introductions and, and talk a little bit about you and I can talk a little bit about uh, maybe for our audience who isn't familiar with um, with how the commission is organized and, and the changes they're going to be going through. So sure. great. So, so with that, so so we're, I'm pleased to be joined. We're going to be joined by um, commissioners uh, Caroline Crenshaw and uh, Alad Roisman. Um, both of them are two members of a five member commission. And so for those not familiar with how the SEC is organized, it is led by a five member commission and each of the commissioners are appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. Now by statute, the president can only name uh, three of the commissioners by his or her own party. Um, and so at any given time, um, there are commissioners who are in the majority, three of them, and two that are in the minority. Right now, obviously, because um, President Trump is the president, uh, at least for the next uh, two months, um, the commission is a, a full five-member uh, commission. Uh, it is led by Jay Clayton, um, and there are two Republican commissioners, um, and Alad Roisman is one of those. And there are two Democratic commissioners, and Caroline Crenshaw is one of those. Now, on January 20th, when Joe Biden becomes president, um, he will have the opportunity to aim to name a new chairman. In fact, the, the current chairman, uh, Jay Clayton, has announced that he's actually leaving at the end of this year in December. So there'll be a 20-day 20 20 period in January where there will be a 2-2 a member commission and the acting chairman will be designated by President Trump, um, more than likely the senior most Republican commissioner, um, uh, Hester Peirce, will be leading that. And so um, in today's discussion, I have a number of questions for our commissioners. One, the, the first thing I'd like to do um, when, when, when we have them join is to, to, to get them to talk a little bit about themselves. They both have some unique backgrounds. Um, they, um, they have backgrounds that make them well qualified to be commissioners at the SEC, um, but they each have some, some unique things about them. And so I'd like them to talk about that. The second part, what I'd like to have them do is talk about some of their personal priorities. So every commissioner comes in with their own experiences, their own expertise. And you know, the, the, the SEC's mission, it's a three-part mission, which is um, to, um, to facilitate capital formation, um, protect investors and maintain fair, orderly and efficient markets. And so some commissioners have a particular interest or expertise in one of those three parts of the mission. Um, and so they each bring their own uh, expertise to the table. So I wanna try to get to find out from each one of them what they want to talk about there. And then given that we are going to have a changeover in administration, um, what is likely to be on the SEC's agenda in the short run over the next you know, two months? Uh, in the medium term, when they are down to a 2-2 commission, which means that at that point, um, it, every, everything has to be done on an affirmative vote by the commission, um, whether it's regulatory policy or enforcement cases, and so by definition, anything that gets done during that period has to be bipartisan. And then in the longer term, who is Joe Biden likely to nominate and is, what type of person is he likely to nominate as an SEC chairman? Uh, what type of priorities is that chairman going to have? And so those are the, those are, that's the scope of the discussion uh, we're, we're, we're hoping to have today. Great, so Mike, let me ask you a question since uh, we have just a, still another moment or two. So as you pointed out, Many times the commission isn't five people, right? There's a, it's at four or three. I do seem to recall one time it was down to two. And that does pose, and you were a commissioner sometimes, not a full strength. Yeah. That poses a actually logistical challenge and all sorts of other issues because like if there's two commissioners and they run into each other in the hallway, that almost constitutes a public meeting. You got to separate them. You got to make sure they don't bump into each other, right? I yes. mean, there are some real issues surrounding the openness of how the SEC commissioners must conduct themselves. Yes. And uh, I don't, don't know that the audience necessarily appreciates that, um, those, those kinds of details. Yeah, so you're right. There's something called the Government in the Sunshine Act, which the intent of the act is to um, add transparency and accountability to the government. And, and to, as you pointed out, that um, if a quorum of the commission meets together, that's deemed to be, and deliberates on policy issues, that's deemed to be a public meeting and has to be open. And, and so when the SEC does meet as a commission, um, it has to announce it. It puts it in the federal register, it's on the website. Anybody can you know, attend a public meeting. Most of them are done over the web right now. So that's how most people can occur. But you're right, when we, we actually got down to two commissioners. In fact, when I was, when President Trump came in, um, we, we got down to two commissioners. I was acting chairman and then there was Commissioner Stein. 
And when two of us got together, we constituted a quorum. And so we had to be very careful that we didn't trip that, right? And so, you know, now, the, now, you know, the joke between Commissioner Stein and myself was that when we got together, we never talked about policy. We talked about our kids. We talked about <laughs> things going on and all this sort of stuff. But we didn't want to have the appearance of it. So what did we do? Well, first of all, we knew it was coming because the, 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 the former chairman, Mary Jo White, was going to resign on inauguration day. We would get down to two. And we, we had about a two month head start during the lame duck session, you know, to, you know part, of, part of November, December, January, almost three months. And so what we decided to do was meet during that time because we're still, you know, we could, we could talk. Um, and, um, and the quorum at that time was three. So two of us could get together and we sketched out. We said, look, we don't know how long we're going to be down to a one one commission, but there's an opportunity for us to get some bipartisan things done. And so we were actually able to do some things. So for example, we shortened the trade settlement cycle from three days to two days. It was something that had been out there that just had not gotten done. Um, and we did a number of other little things too that I, I was very proud of that we did during that, that, that period. Um, and then once we got into, once January 20th hit and I was acting chairman, we were down to two of us. How did we, how did we work? Well, I could talk to her councils. She could talk to my councils and our councils could talk to each other. And so that's how we got around it. And so one of the things that, that, um, that, that, that um, commit both Commissioner Crenshaw and Commissioner Royceman have um, in terms of their, their background is they both served as councils to former commissioners. And so um, that is a hugely important role. And one of the things I'm hoping to get out of our discussion is the fact that you know, by serving as councils, they were the go-betweens most of the time between the commissioner's offices not only during, you know, when we got down to two commissioners, but even when you're at a full commission of five, three commissioners can't get together and meet. You have to do sort of do one-on-one -on -one shuttle diplomacy back and forth. So, um, so the councils get involved in, in all kinds of things. Yeah, it's fascinating to do, but you, you use an example, which I think is, which reinforces the point I made um, earlier about the criticality of the SEC. One of the things you got done bipartisan was moving settlement from T3 to T2. And for those who outside this industry, and maybe even a lot of people within the industry, don't understand how important it is. I had come into the industry a long time ago when they just moved from T5 to T3. And the first thing that everybody saw, realized was with the certainty about the settlement moving two days earlier and now from three to two, there is so much more certainty among the buyers and sellers and what they do, they redeploy that capital back into the markets, it increases liquidity. It is a tremendously positive thing to shorten the settlement cycle to allow for, um, for buyers to get their securities earlier and sellers to get their, their capital earlier. And I know that they're still working on, there's a plan to keep going, um, uh, to keep going, uh, you know, down T1, T0, et cetera, yep. and all those kinds of things. But uh, anyway, but I, that was up to me as a perfect example of bipartisan work to do what's best for the entire market and how the SEC can lead by, you know, getting those kinds of things done. Because I, I, I don't, you know, it's, it's one of those things you don't realize, but the plumbing of the securities industry yes. really makes it work. Yeah, it does. And, th and thank you for mentioning, right? So it, yeah, we, we were very proud of it. It takes out systemic risk in the system. There's overnight sort of credit in there. It makes the system more efficient. And you brought up sort of, you know, going to T1 or T0. And the question is, well, why didn't we shorten the settlement cycle even shorter? Um, and we decided that at the time, it was, it was much easier to go from T3 to T2 for a couple of reasons. One, a lot of the other um, developed markets, capital markets in the world were on a T2 settlement cycle. So one of the things it did was it aligned us with them. And so global financial institutions that have to work across different markets, it makes it much easier and there's added consistency with them. The other thing we ran into, right? So people kept coming to us and they would, they would scream blockchain, 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 right? We can just go to T0 and do this with you know, T plus epsilon or a very small period of time. And while that may be, be true in the case of, of um, you know, settling uh, the securities transactions, one of the things we also have to remember is that you know, when people transfer money back and forth, we're using the banking payment system. And there are some people who still write checks to their brokers that has to go through the check clearing process, which can take up to two days. So one of the things we were mindful of was we didn't want to go to a situation where the, the securities would clear on, say, a T1 basis, but then the check would come back with non-sufficient funds you know, on, on day two. And so we ran into that. So we went as far as we could, given the, the speed of the current payment system in the US. And so um, you're right, we could get further efficiencies out of the system, but what that would require 
is that the banking regulators and the Securities and Exchange Commission would have to work in concert with one another. And then again, at the global level, um, you know, trying to make sure that we're, we're coordinated with everybody else. So yeah, that's good. Great. Thank you.